Hey everybody, welcome to Mighty Blaze. We're having a special edition tonight with one of our very own our tech guru, Margaret Pinard, who is also an author. Welcome, Margaret. We're so happy to have you in your finery. Thank you. Yes, crushed velvet for the occasion. Lace and crushed velvet. I wore my lace in honor of Margaret. So I actually got out of my t-shirt because she <laughs> inspired me. And we're here tonight to talk about her book, Fabled Passages. Would you show us your beautiful cover? Thank you so much. Um, it is a collection of short stories. That is, oh, cool gamer. There's a cool gamer here. Hi, cool gamer. Hi. <laughs> Um, so it's a collection of short stories that ranges from the historical to the speculative to like flirting with the edges of horror. And before we talk more about fabled passages, I'm going to talk a tiny bit about a mighty blaze in case you have just stumbled upon the blaze for the first time. Welcome, welcome. We are a team of 35 creative professional volunteers dedicated to helping writers reach readers in the age of COVID, Delta, Delta Omicron, whatever we're in now, the endemic. Far beyond the endemic because digital is here to stay. Where else can you meet authors and not even have to put on pants? So this is like the <laughs> service that we are providing. And if you like what you see here, please give us a like or follow on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube. We are ubiquitous. And please consider signing up for our newsletter. So you'll never have literary FOMO ever again. No mo FOMO. Nobody likes that. And if you are watching us on YouTube and you haven't subscribed yet, I think it would be really sweet if you subscribe. So thank you very much like, for doing that. Um, we will add a lot of lit to your literary life. So um, without further ado, we're going to welcome Margaret here. We have all these fantastic people joining us. Hello, everybody. Tell us where you're joining us from this evening. I am joining from Boston with my bourbon drink. So <laughs> welcome. Chin chin. Okay, putting down my drink now so I can introduce Margaret. Margaret Bernard is historical and fiction fantasy writer based, <laughs> based in the moss forest known as Portland. Her historical <laughs> and she has many novels in addition to this collection of short stories. Explore stories of struggle and intrigue in the 19th century, hence the attire, while her latest work, the short story collection, Fabled Passages, hold up your book, please. Thank you. As my agent says, always get your product placement in there. She's French. So here's your product placement. Oh, Margaret Short placement. Buddha, get your product placement in there. Margaret Short Story Collection, Fabled Passages Placed with Historical and Fantasy Genre Expectations. True that. I have read it and I can't testify. Margaret has co founded Yola Book, Yola Book of Load. I thought I had learned sufficiently how to say that. Yola Book of Load. PDX, which is an Icelandic themed indie book festival, which we participated in, which was awesome in 2020. It's been a booktuber, author tuber, and blazer since 2020 as well. Welcome, Margaret, to your own Fabu platform. Thank you. Yeah, Yola Boca Float is actually what got Mighty Blaze on TikTok, isn't it? <laughs> like, Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Some before, but I think that was like the first time we had like whole blaze activity on TikTok, and I was like, "Wow, this is it." Cool. Was and if you were like our fifth festival that year, I think that we put online. But you were the first Icelandic one and the first TikTok one, so that was very exciting. And probably the first YouTube one as well, because I don't know if we were doing Streamyard yet, but here we are. And what is it like to be on the blaze as an author as opposed to the person, the wizard, doing all the controls behind the scenes? Let's start there. A little crazy. It's kind of like um, a kid playing dress up in, in big people clothes because <laughs> I watch you guys, um, you know, intro these big name authors and they get their spotlight and everything. And I love sitting in on the people whose work I've admired for a long time and, you know, get to geek out and fangirl a little. And then being the featured author on one is like, oh, hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so. It is like a weirdly humbling experience. And we've done, as you know, hundreds of author interviews by now. And I have been myself in the hot seat. Like for one, my, my Woodrow book came out last year and it's going to come out um, again in paperback next week. And I was kind of like, duh, duh, duh. you know, like I was being interviewed by Mark Cecil, our thoughtful bro, and I'll be interviewed again next week. It was Yay. surprisingly uh, shy making, I think, to mm. try to or the questions, even though I had written the book, so I thought I knew all the answers. But there's, it's, it feels like such an honor, right? So there's things sort of humbling about it. So tell us about 
fabled passages for those who have not yet had the pleasure of reading it and check out her product placement. Très bien. Like, how do I, there, oh, no, the lighting. Like, the lighting, lighting director here. Cover. Yes, it's a great <laughs> too, which I will ask about. But um, yeah, if you want to tell us about um, what is the collection about? How would you describe it? So it's a short collection of bite-sized experimental fiction. And before the pandemic, like from 2013 to 2019, I put out five books that were historical fiction. One was a mystery, one was a YA, and three were part of a trilogy that were like straight drama family saga. So very sort of middle of the road historical genre. And um, the pandemic sort of like rocked the boat a little bit. Hey, Gwena. And made me sort of, I don't know, internal collapse, right? We had burnout, we had isolation, we had what is this crazy external internal imbalance? You know, it's like the cell wall was, was crumbling. And that is the transition that made me think, well, what am I doing? I had a, I had a Chicago historical fiction novel that I was working on and no, it wasn't working. And I had a novella that I had put together, but like that wasn't working. And so what finally started me um, having fun with fiction again was like flash mm -hmm. fiction with people on YouTube and then like short stories of stuff from my past and just sort of like glimpses of dreams that I would wind around um, at a, a, an idea basically. So that is why this collection came into being is experimental and fun and sort of twisting things that I thought I shouldn't. <laughs> I love the idea of making fiction fun again because I feel as though so many authors had their concentration shattered during the pandemic, both as writers and as readers. I can't tell you how many people I heard say, I just, I can't write anymore. I can't read anymore. My attention span is, is like totally broken. And I still feel as though as an author, I can't quite claw my way back to things being fun. Like we just had an author on, um, Matthew Quick wrote Silver Linings Playbook. He was yeah, on yeah. Playbook last week. And he was talking about how he hit a terrible writer's block and the only way he could get going again was to do an epistolary novel. So a novel basically all in letters. And, wow. and he was I know how to write a letter, even if I don't know how to write a novel anymore. Do you think that um, part of the sort of experimental time bending, genre bending, thin stories nature of the collection is because you were stuck within four walls and wanted to sort of bend the time space continuum? Hmm, maybe. Uh, one of the things that I think really jumps out at, so I had a few more stories than this. And I thought at the beginning when I was like, maybe I'll make it a collection that it should be longer. And then I looked at the other stories and I was like, I don't really think those fit in with any sort of theme. So if I want to bind it together, what will, what is jumping out of most of these so that people can get an experience that feels like a journey rather than just a jumble a box of stuff. Right. And, um, the thing that came out of eight of them at least was um, regrets and second chances. And mm. that is something that really sort of reaches out for time bending, you know, like bend the rules, like make the world you want to see instead of the one that is in front of you. And so that's, I think what led me into the time travel and multiverse and that sort of side of the spectrum actually is the theme. Um, yeah. So I like that a lot. We have our thoughtful bro here tonight, Mark Cecil. Hi, Mark. The books that seem like a journey with love this, Mark. And also Mark's book, Bunyan, is coming out in 2024. And it is a retelling of the American myth of Paul Bunyan. So Mark has a sort of a steampunk aspect to his yes. novels as well. It's going to be a trilogy. And I would, I would love to actually talk about your previous trilogy as well, Margaret. So I think that the sort of regret second chances thing you think that also maybe was a pandemic theme that you know we're all sitting in our rooms thinking like how could I have done things differently or does the pandemic itself seem like a giant do-over to you? I feel like that not just for me for everyone I feel like the pandemic led to stewing in your own juices kind of feels right so if you were not mm -hmm. you were what <laughs> in bourbon that's a good juice if you were, nice. you were one of the few that was not prone to ruminating beforehand like this would have pushed you over the edge and so um i think that's probably something that is 
specialized for people who have a certain amount of privilege is thinking like, well, this is my life now, but what if I had made a different choice and that sort of thing? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but the pandemic in terms of other effects um, and, and the short story collection. Um, I think, I think if you think of like pushing off of a wall in a swimming pool to push yourself in the other direction, what the mm -hmm. pandemic did for me is show like, here's, here's what you don't want to do anymore. Try something new. Right. So if it was, this is not getting you anywhere, try a different direction, bozo. Like that was the sort of push that I got from what my work was telling me. Now that's individual. And I don't know if, I don't know if that's a generalized right or reaction. What do you think, Jenna? Did you? I don't think it's going to be there are a lot of there are a lot of pivots in the industry, and then there are a lot of personal sort of pivots as well. I think with the various authors, so I feel like we all got put in a big sack that got shaken around, and people are still trying to I find it. Big chicken. Them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so it seems that you have found a lane and a good way to deal with that sort of pandemic marination or rumination or whatever sort yeah. of Asian you want to call it by producing these stories. So we have this great comment from Barrett. Hi, Barrett. Surprised me most of the stories felt very open to the interpretation of the reader, not all of them, but my favorites from this collection were all left with endings that left me thinking. So sort of a choose your own adventure, ambiguous ending theme. Do you want to talk about, or, or structure, I should say, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, um, so to me, it felt like the genre that I had chosen matched well with ambiguous um, turns of phrase and endings because in a world that has different multiverses and a world that has um, choices that go different ways that, that jump in time and back and have the possibility for um, minds changing, I felt like uh, the stories themselves should also be open to different interpretations. So mm. I, it seemed very natural to me, and I don't know if it makes sense from the outside, but yeah, that's that's how that flowed. That was I, great. That. I, I was like obsessed with choose your own adventure books as a kid, and maybe that's why a lot of my own work has these open endings that are up to mm. the reader interpretation. But I also feel yeah. as though fiction is reflective of life if it's more person, right? We don't always know what the neat endings of the stories are going to be in life. Why would that be the case in, in fiction unless you're writing like rom com or something? Which is right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. When you need the when you need the happy ending. Barrett also commented, "There's rawness to the stories that left off the page. Margaret's work always felt very polished, and this collection. You have a fan guy here. This collection <laughs> filled with good ideas that are both timely." And classic. It was such a great comment, Barrett. And I hope everybody is putting these comments on Goodreads and Amazon. <laughs> Sorry to say that. <laughs> but the, the reviews on Amazon, it helps the readers. So there, I just shorted out my own computer. This might be a really good time to have you describe a couple of the stories, Margaret, for those who are just joining us and haven't read the stories yet. Yes. Um, maybe describe a couple of um, your favorites. And then maybe would you read us a little bit? Sure. Um, so to describe the stories, there's eight. They're varying in length. So some started out as flash fiction and got stretched a little bit. So they're very short. And some are more developed ideas that are, you know, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 pages. Um, so again, short collection. But um, they're placed in 18th, 19th centuries some of them. They're placed in modern contexts, some of them. They're given supernatural elements. They're given um, sci-fi fantasy elements. So the characters are confronted with um, uh, some way that they can either change their fate or, you know, acquiesce to what is happening. And that's sort of the point is like grasping at the power. The, the tweet that I um, put out today was rest the power. And, it, you know, among my friends, eat the rich is a popular hashtag, but I felt like rest the power was appropriate to this collection. So, you know, a little twist, a little twist. Um, so, yes. And you wanted me to read from the longest story. So it's just going to be a little piece from the beginning to give you a taste. 
Oh, I didn't realize that I still had Tay Tay on in the background. Yeah, Good. That's fine. <laughs> but I went in to say that Barrett requested. I'm going to say that Barrett requested this. Although I'm actually the one who requested this Barrett Cosmo at Crossroads, which of course is my favorite because there's a dog in it. And the yeah, story is from the dog's point of view. So I was like, holla to the dogs. But also, I really love stitches in time. And I, I think about like the sort of, I like a good time travel story like everybody else, but this one seemed to have a particular modern day resonance to it, at least in the opening pages. And so I would love to ask you to read a little bit of that for okay. story hour this evening. So we'll do stitches in time. And then, um, since I haven't gotten to talk about this yet, uh, just touch on the um, YouTube community and how it sort of influenced this story, actually. Oh, so. Believe me, I have YouTube questions. Come <laughs> to YouTube. I will ask, do not worry. And thank you for joining us, YouTubers. We see you. Yay! Okay, so it's an excerpt from Stitches in Time. The first time it happened, Oliver remembered the obnoxious, sunshiny smell of the dryer sheet. He'd been walking along a street in Portland and spotted a spout of steam puffing from a hedge, which was ostensibly guarding the vent to some apartment building's laundry room. As he spluttered at the overpowering chemical scent, he emerged from a cloud of steam to find himself in a hot, dusty lane. Gone were the hedge, the apartment building, and Portland. The air smelled strongly of sage and, was that horse manure? He recognized the smell, but his mind struggled struggled to connect it with the reality of his senses. Slowly, he took in a 360 of his environment. The wide dirt lane was bordered by weathered fencing. On the left side, a few black cattle grazed, while on the right, a brown horse nickered at him. Completing his circuit, he saw a dust cloud growing up the road. Horses eventually materialized, galloping toward him. What the actual... Before he could finish his 21st century expletive, a voice called from beyond the cattle, where a man emerged from a dip in the ground, followed by two women. They looked like poor farmers, clad in raggedy coveralls and straw hats. They were black and bent from working in the hot sun, the same sun which had started to make Oliver sweat rivulets down his shoulder blades. I say, where you come from? That's where I'll stop. I love that. Thank you. And I love the idea that the smell of an obnoxious chemical dryer sheet precedes that jump into the past. And then the juxtaposition of like what the actual your dialogue and all of this is fantastic. You have a great ventriloquist thing going on, whether you're like doing the 18th century characters or the modern day characters. And the juxtaposition of that dialogue is really funny to me. It's part of like if the story, they're sort of their frequency, like the the time travel stories. So I'm I'm gonna just define, I'm assuming that most people in the audience know this, but I had to look it up actually, since I love the short story so much as a form. Um, and I sometimes read experimental fiction and I have people in my novel workshop writing speculative fiction and I throw that term around like I know what I'm talking about and I do not. So from your <laughs> own book, um, speculative to fiction is Fiction is defined here as fiction that tells a story that could not have actually happened in the passages. Stories um, story that could not have actually happened in our world with its natural laws and somewhat objective history. So we're bending again that sort of space time continuum. Can you talk a little bit about your own bending from writing historical fiction to that more speculative fiction? You, you mentioned a little bit about how the pandemic made you want to escape a little bit the confines of what you've been working on before, but what were some of the challenges of working in this new genre and what are the joys? Oh, okay. Um, the different bends. So I think originally writing in historical uh, fiction, what I thought I was doing, this is funny, this is how you set out with like, this is what I'm gonna do, and then you end up doing something totally different. Um, what I thought I was doing was highlighting an injustice that had happened in the past to help people see similar situations of people that they could have empathy for in the present. And it doesn't seem to connect for people. They seem to just keep it very separate. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, okay. So immigrants in the 19th century, Scotland coming to Canada, like it's a good story, but it has nothing to do with me now. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was writing the speculative thing, I feel like there's a little bit more, um, what's 
amperage isn't a word. Voltage? Voltage available to you to like maybe? Was or like, oh, I see what you're saying, like sort of like the juice in the story to like yeah. get your point. You've got instead of instead of sticks from the 18th century, you've got like a plug in the wall to electrocute someone with the message rather than like a stick. Always a good author aim, electrocute your reader. Agree. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I feel like I could I could juice it up more. And in a short story, you need to have something that's really juicy to like grab people because you don't have a lot of space. And so you have to choose, you know, the one thing or the the three points of the story. Um, that the character is going to learn or going to um, struggle against or decide or something. Um, so I think the tools are different. The world building is very similar. And I've had conversations with fantasy and sci-fi authors on YouTube where it's like, um, it's all about world building. We love getting into the details. We love doing research. And whether it's real research or fantasy research, it it feels as meaningful to the author, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, very similar disciplines, but different tools. And so I liked uh, for this format, perhaps for this structure, I liked having more shocking tools and more um, thought provoking situations than have, mm -hmm. than have been used in historical, at least in mine in the past, so. That's really interesting because I always think of historical fiction, which I also generally write as holding up a mirror to the present in the same way that good sci-fi or good dystopia holds a mirror back up to ourselves. Yeah. But it asks the reader to, to engage in a sort of reading metaphor. Like you have to understand that the historical situation being presented is meant to actually reflect what we're living in now and give a warning or give a, a commentary of some sort and do it obliquely. Whereas what you're doing now actually just shrinks the time periods together so there's no avoiding that so if you had if you had a, a reader who was like oh i didn't actually get that you know that equation between past and present you're like well you do now because your eyeballs that i input in the so that must have been sort of a relief do you have a favorite story among the stories a pet yes yes um I know, I know. So um, it it's probably not obvious. Uh, Barrett was surprised when I told him, but I have had some of these stories for like eight or nine years, just sort of like mm -hmm. in pieces um, and picked back up and finally like found the point or found the ending or the, the feeling that I wanted to evoke with it. Um, and some were done like this summer. So there's there's a wide range of like versions of Margaret that started these stories, um, but one that I think is just a year a year in the making uh, actually calls back to something that I did in high school, which is uh, theater, and I have a special author artifact. I have <laughs> I didn't realize what it on the back. Okay, so this if you can see. This is my high school, Ooh. Mission College Preparatory, Hamlet performance in 1997, before inflation hit, only $7. And um, this is when I played Ophelia in Hamlet. So this is very meaningful in terms of my life experience and like growing up and learning about textual analysis and all that. And um, yeah, so I just remember that experience of forming community and telling a story and bringing someone's anguish to light as as a really big point and so I revisited that in one of the stories and that's the one that I just love because instead of Ophelia having the end in Hamlet she gets her own ending which is steampunk and sassy AF <laughs> so yes that's what I did instead <laughs> So awesome. So it's kind of like one of those like women behind the throne stories, except a short story and steampunk, which is like just a mixing bowl of like amazing ideas. Tell us about the short story form, like going from a novel, which of course is so expensive and shrinking everything down to a short story in which you have very little time to get your point across. How was that? Why did you choose that medium? Um... I think that my feeling in what I wanted to communicate matched up with the energy of the form. So when you think of short stories, you think of, well, at least I do. You are more of a master of short stories. So tell me if you if you agree. But the urgency 
is kind of what I was feeling about um, the messages and the stories because it's about fighting and it's about um, standing your ground in a good way and um, you know resting the power mm -hmm. and so I see that as something that we need to do in America right now and so that is like the little bit of the me the political me that is like poured into these stories it's an urgency for people to um, embrace their power embrace their community like do something um, and my novels are so when Barrett says they feel more polished I feel like it's more of a distant voice you mm -hmm. do get into characters who are going through a lot but it's like it's 200 years ago it's um, it's already happened I don't know I, I'd have to think about that some more but um, yeah urgency of the short story form and like the the power of the um genre tools <laughs> it's such an interesting answer because i would not think of the emotional impetus for writing the story as dictating the form of the story like usually mm -hmm. people are like well i just wanted to write a short story and then they find out that like it's really hard to write a short story um because you have so much less time to say anything yeah. Yeah. um i like the idea that the emotional urgency that you feel in this era actually made you write something that requires that sort of urgency to actually get the tale told yeah and i've i've tried short stories before because as a good little writer i learned that you're supposed to submit short stories to journals and that's how you get your name done and that's how you get credits and that's how you get taken seriously when you're querying and i tried to trot down that path and it just did not work for me so i was like okay um, short stories are not what is calling to me right now. What is calling to me is a long saga where I can like take this history that is so compelling to me, these people who had their own way of life and were doing fine on their own. They weren't asking any favors. And then the sort of backlash or backdraft, I guess, of economic world empire sucks them into this vortex of, oh no, you, you're not allowed to stay where you are anymore. Welcome to the new century. Um, yeah, and industrialization. So, yeah. So that was like the grand scheme, and and it was just such a different feeling. So, yeah. I feel like everything you're writing is so relevant because who in the past two and a half years has not been sucked into the vortex of like a historical chapter that we did not expect? So, in a way, we all sort of like went through this little time travel wormhole in the past two and a half years. I saw a friend today I hadn't seen for two and a half years. I finally saw a person we kept like poking each other and being like, oh my God, you're actually real AF. Like you're real, you're real. She had had like a child in that time, you know? So yeah. Like, we like, and we had started The Blaze. So there are all of these amazing things that we sort of got dragged into that one. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, well, I mean, we yeah. joke about the, the, compression of time or like what is time and I now I hate that phrase because I use it so much and I hear it so much I'm just like tired of it but like we do really have a, I think when we don't have routines and we don't have things that are stable around us that we can count on I think you get a magnified sense of like some things feel really short and some things feel really long and the feeling is kind of what makes up your life it's not time is static it's like no your life is how you feel it how you go through it so it's crazy. It's crazy. Is what it is. Do you feel like your life is stabilizing a little bit more post pandemic? Are we in the post pandemic? Where are we? What time are we in, Margaret? <laughs> You're the person to ask. Do you, no, do you feel like no. you're sort of sifting down into a recognizable shape or are you still in kind of like adventure land? I mean, at various points, I felt like, okay, I'm choosing this and I'm choosing this and I'm choosing this. And I've sort of like locked onto a right turn by all these choices. Um, but I don't feel like it's stable yet. I still, I mean, and you know, there's something happening in the next five days that is a big, a big indicator of what the future will be like. So. Hey, Anissa. That would be so fun. <laughs> Hi, Anissa. Okay, I think I have to say that like, the one stable thing I could count on during the pandemic was yeah. <laughs> every place, but then like making it a party. Like, oh. you know, the party says here, Anissa, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who has shown up tonight and everybody who's been keeping all of us writers afloat on YouTube and on Facebook and everywhere we are. Margaret, you mentioned community a little bit um, earlier, and you also talked about 
the booktube community. Like I know you are a booktuber, the only booktuber I know. So can you talk a little bit about the community on YouTube that has helped define you as an author and help shape this collection of short stories? Yes. Um, so I, I forgot to check in with you about the giveaway too. We we're going to do a giveaway at the end of this, right? Yes, always. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll pull that up in a second. But um, so the story that I read a little piece of Stitches in Time um, is about <laughs> someone being pulled back involuntarily into a uh, very specific moments in the past that we maybe didn't know about before summer 2020. Um, I learned about things like the burning of Tulsa, uh, Black Wall Street, um, the, um, oh, now I'm going to blank on it, the uh, Juneteenth holiday in, in Texas, and things like this coming out because of all the racial tension and the George Floyd riots um, and all that in summer 2020, right? And so as we're going through this learning process of like, wow, there's all this history we don't know. Historical fiction author didn't know, you know? And um, so taking that in and being able to process it and um, share it with other people in some way that is both respectful and um, I guess talking to the audience that you imagine instead of speaking for other people. Uh, that's sort of what I was aiming to do. So when I joined BookTube in spring, summer 2020, um, that was a big thing on the landscape. It was people talking about um, justice for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and like all these things that were going on while we were trapped behind walls or while we were, you know, um, Anyway, yes, in crisis. Let's put that put it that way. Yeah. And uh, so, meeting people on BookTube and meeting people on AuthorTube, which for anyone who doesn't know is just people who are on YouTube either watching videos and talking about books in the comments or making videos and talking about books on the video like this. Um, I got to just meet a lot of different kinds of people. Right now I live in Portland, Oregon, which is very white. And I didn't go out of my house, so I didn't see anyone but my cat. So it was a very limited experience. But through YouTube, I could see channels that were talking about these types of issues. I could learn about the um, books that were being written about um, the justice system and nonfiction and analysis of economic trends and um, the redlining that's happened, all this historical stuff that like has just been covered up. And so like blows my mind, right? So I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know people who pay attention to that and are doing the same thing, trying to process it, trying to address it, trying to connect with channels who are bringing this to light. And um, Stitches in Time was like my sort of first attempt at trying to do this. <laughs> like, what could I, contribute that doesn't usurp someone else's voice, but still is mindful of all that is happening mm -hmm. and trying to say something positive. Mm -hmm. and the positive can change, right? We can change. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I hope so. I think there's been a lot of sort of galvanic change in this country. And then a lot of people who are fighting that with every ounce of resistance that they have. Um, but it, it is something you just voiced. It is a big front of house thought all the time, I think, especially for white writers now, which is how do we portray respectfully like things that have happened in our history and happened in our country without appropriating somebody else's voice. So right. I, th I think it very inspiring that you have a community that you can go to to maybe ask that question and to learn more. It kind of sounds like for those of you who aren't booktubers, would like to know more about booktube, it's kind of like C-SPAN, but actually interesting. Is that, <laughs> is that an accurate description? Um, no, it's the book themselves. It's the book recommendations that are like C-SPAN. I don't think I have any channels that I'm subscribed to that actually go through things like C-SPAN. They're much more interesting. They're much more um, excited, enthusiastic uh, people who are talking about what they got from books and, you know, honest reviews. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome.
Yeah, the this other, is what I mean. Sorry, go ahead, tell me. Oh, I was just gonna say the other thing that I have in my book that is not previously in my book is um, LGBTQIA representation. So characters, they're not the main characters because I can't speak to that um, experience, but they're the parents and they're the friends and they're the people who matter in the stories to the timeline. So I've tried to represent that and you know put that on the page for people as well because now I know so many more from the booktube community. In that way, I feel like the pandemic has been a little bit of a silver lining because we got to be introduced to this whole new community and really explore it. And it sounds like it's informed your work. Is that a fair characterization? Um, yeah, I'm wondering what the difference is. Uh, I think it's because I think Margaret's frozen. Oh no. Oh no. I can't I'm back. You. Oh, I'm you're back. back. Okay. Did you time travel just then? Did you just go somewhere like to Juneteenth, like the original Juneteenth day you did, didn't you? No, no. I made the mistake. I'm on Wi Fi, even though I'm plugged in. So, anyway, oops. Um, but yeah, like no, I, I definitely had friends in the community before, but I didn't make the connection that like they should be in my books or like I should be, because like they write books and I write books. Like, what's the deal? But then I was like, oh, there's all these people who are who are reading books who want to see themselves. Maybe maybe that's something that I should listen to because I'm in this community, you know? Mm -hmm. I just hadn't hit me before. And maybe because I was focusing on it so much, interacting with those people so much that it, it did. I don't know. I don't know. Growing. It started to saturate in, started to sink in. And growing is always good. Do you think it can stay with a short story form? Are you feeling the itch to get back to a longer project? Or are you thinking still about short stories? So the next thing in my pipeline is a novella. So the in-between, it's going to be a prequel for the series. So I'm going back to historical, but novella. So like 30,000 words. Um, but I do feel, I still get those like, ding, like a little like microwave light ding going off of <laughs> short story ideas. And you can tell, like, I can tell that it's, it's not a novel idea. It's weird. Do you get that? Where you get an idea and you're yeah. like, this could be, you're like, no, it's this or it's this. It's not. It couldn't be both ways. I do get that. I miss writing the short stories. When I write a novel, it always starts as a short story. And then I try and trick myself into thinking like, oh, it novels just a whole bunch of short stories put together. Like I also love the idea of the novel in stories where they're linked, like all Elizabeth Strout stories. And yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, and then the reader gets to sort of figure out what the link is or it's implied by the juxtaposition of the stories. But um, I... I think that, like, for me, a short story is a window into a world where you're looking at a character making a decision that's going to affect that character for the rest of his or her life, um, or their lives, but they don't know that. You know that. And I always feel like the short stories are a little weird. Like, there's always, like, a sort of a weirdness to them, and the people in them are, like, a little weird, and that's how I know they're successful short stories. Which is like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's like a novel is like, you know, you're looking through the window for three years watching somebody move around in that rear window kind of way. But the short story, you just watch them for like a night and you're like, oh my God, that's when you did the thing, you know? So I, I think they're such an amazing form. I just, I love them. They're so yeah. delicious. And you just um, said a phrase that I really liked, which, which was implied by juxtaposition. And I feel like that's the mode that I operate in a lot of the time. And so I'm like, oh, I got to note that. Remember that for later because that's. That's inspiring. I, I'm I'm jazzed to like think about that some more. <laughs> Absolutely inspired. But what did I even say? <laughs> Not inspired by juxtaposition, implied by juxtaposition. Implied, right? yeah, yeah. Okay, Just like that. putting these two things together. Hmm. I wonder what I'm trying to say. What do you think? <laughs> Uh, I know, right? But that's for the reader to figure out. We're just humble writers. I think it's a little bit like um, when you're at an art exhibit, there's a lot of thought that's given to what painting hang next to what paintings because right. they either interfere with each other or inform each other. Right. And I feel like they put short stories side by side, or even when you put sentences side by side, they kind of not infect. That's not quite, quite the right word, but they form each Sometimes. other in the same way. Yeah, they really do. It's, yeah, putting like, you know, blue and yellow together, you get green. So you put those senses together, they're going to shine color on each other. Um, Anissa asked a great question. Um, are short stories harder to write than a novel? What a really, really good question. What do you think about that, Missy? So 
like I said, it's 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 one or the other. When the ideas come to me, it's it's going to be a short story or it's going to be a novel to me. So like when the um, Liz, I don't know, I forgot her last name. Who wrote? Uh, no, no, Elizabeth Gilbert was Gilbert. Her thing about the the genius that comes and visits, and if you don't pay attention to it, it goes away to someone else to try to get the idea to bring to life. Yeah, no um, pressure there. Yeah. <laughs> So when the genius like visits with the idea and says here, and I receive that idea either as a dream or a thought or a meditation and journal or something, I think this feels like a short story or this feels like a novel. So I can't really, um, I mean, one happens much faster than the other. Does it mean that it's easier? That could be true <laughs> or it could not. Um, yeah. Some of these went through lots of editing and some did not. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me which ones you think did. <laughs> I don't know. I always like to try and guess when I'm reading a novel what the genesis was. Like what what was the the sentence that inspired the author or the image or the scene? Um, when I was a little girl, I had puzzles where some of the pieces were actual shapes of things. Like they were they were embedded and hidden in the puzzle. Like there would be an umbrella oh, or a flower. Oh, that's cool. Star or a moon, which is really cool, right? But you couldn't see them in when the whole puzzle was done, but you knew they were there. And I feel the same way about novels and story collections i'm like what was the the inspiration that sparked this whole project so i'm wondering about that for you like when you get that sort of original inspiration you talked about um dreams like getting inspiration in dreams getting inspiration in um i don't think you said meditation i'm going to pretend you did um, so <laughs> What is one of those moments that you can talk about that's sort of embedded in the story collection? Oh, a moment of inspiration. Okay, so here I'm gonna I'm gonna visit my little cheat sheet of this is my operating document of like the stories when I went to put them together and all the, I the love it. And it's handwritten and it's written with colors. I totally love it. Like yes. I use stuff all the time. Like I have colored everything like colored highlighters and colored pens because that's how I think yes Sorry, um, ecstasy moment there. <laughs> okay so there's two that I can remember so the photograph mm -hmm. and this is like a shout out to Natalie Locke and Chanda Arthur because they do a flash fiction every Saturday morning or almost every Saturday morning right in on YouTube so they're um Natalie Locke's channel that is the prompt the prompt was the moment before the photograph and so that's what I wrote. And then like I finessed it a little. Yeah. So that's the inspiration for that one. Completely external. But the the one I remember the genesis of of my own was the Devon, a Devon Pisky or Pixie. So shortcut, like um, the Cornish language and the Devon, Devonshire, no, Devonshire language. The SK and the KS were often reversed. So when they say pisky, it, it's the same as pixie because it's just reversed. I thought that was fascinating, but then I am a nerd. Um, so that is a longer story about time travel. And it was started because I was thinking about misogyny. <laughs> Pixies, misogyny. How? How does a writer do that? As one does. I think, yeah. well, I, it makes sense to me. Stephen King talks about um, short story ideas and novel ideas as having ideas being like pool balls. They're different ideas, but they, they bounce together and then ricochet off in different directions and a different direction is the story. And I love that idea. So pixie misogyny doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. And he's like, when I'm writing, I've been drawn to writing short stories and enjoy writing them. And so you're coming on the show. Like we would like to host you and hear you read one of your short stories. Like you and me, kid, are going to talk about short stories. We're going to do a special Anita short story, and, and I'm not kidding. I think that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be yeah. really good. So we have time, I think, for one more question. And I will encourage audience members, if you're watching, like post your questions in the chat. We do have one from our friend. Actually, no, we have, I have one from our friend, Mark. Uh, what do you want most for this book? What would happen on your publishing journey in your wildest dreams? I love Mark. He's so optimistic about it. You have to you know what you're doing before you can achieve it, right? Yes. Um, those are two different questions, right? To me. I don't know if they're different questions. I mean, to me, they're not. And maybe this speaks to what kind of writers we are. Like, I like, I'm a horror for fame and money. And maybe you're not a horror for fame and money. Fine. 
That's fine. Not everybody is a human money whore, but so answer both questions, please. Um, what do I want most mm -hmm. for the book? Um, I'll see all of my realistic goals are coming up or coming to mind, right? And that's not what he's asking. <laughs> like, oh, yes. yeah, I feel like, I feel like my stability has been dependent on keeping realistic expectations. And so like growth, like with every new book I put out, I want it to build on the know-how of the last one. So with publishing, that means I tried a new publisher this time. I tried a new format. Um, I tried a new medium, like short story collection. So all this is new and I want to take in all that learning and uh, amp it up for the next one. But for this book, what is my wildest dream? I don't know. Like I can tell you my wildest dream for the Remnants trilogy, which okay. was, um, I saw, uh, and I referenced this in a sprint today, I saw an interview with David Tennant, who is a British actor and has been Doctor Who and, and lots of other things, Broadchurch, he's famous. And he was on this genealogy show where he talked about, or he learned about his family history. Some of them were from Northern Ireland and they were not so great, but the other ones were from Mull. And as he was talking about his family that lived on this croft and got pushed off and then had to emigrate and went to the city. And I was like, you are dictating the plot of my book, David Tennant. Could you please sponsor a project where this gets developed? <laughs> so there, that is the answer I have for the keening. Yeah. All right. I think that is an excellent answer. If David Tennant is watching, please be watching so that there you can go. make Margaret's book into a series and a movie and a movie and a series and all of the things. Tell us what the fate of the trilogy is. Are you done with the trilogy? Is it like... It is done as is. There is an envisioned, you know, aftermath, but um, I I would need to travel to Australia, and I haven't done that in the past three years. Um, that is why I'm writing the prequel, which happens in, like, 1810, 1811, and that's, like, I, as I said, the next in the pipeline is the prequel. So we're going to go back to Mull because I have lots of resources staring me in the face from, like, three trips um, to... Argyle and the Western Isles, and I love that area of the world. So yeah, lots to draw on. So fun. I think that um, one of the best things about writing, I haven't thought of it in terms of time travel, although that's what historical authors do, of course, but like there's armchair travel element to it that you get to engage in when you're both writing and when you're reading. So thank you for giving us so much of that armchair travel through time, travel through experience. Like just love the question. Will you please show us a beautiful cover of your book one more time <laughs> so that everybody can see it and also buy it. Yeah. Download at least 50 copies of this and send them to everybody you know who is interested in time travel and experimental fiction. And Margaret will be for you. Like she'll come to your house <laughs> on a Zoom card and Jimmy. I thought Kimberly from Authors Love Bookstores was the only person who shimmied on the, in the Blaze fan, but now I know differently. So Margaret, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. It's so Pretty great fair. to have you in front of the camera. And let's like let's shimmy our way out. Okay. I have the giveaway to pop up. You ready? Oh my god! It's giveaway. Yeah, you, I'll shimmy while you give away. Go ahead. There we go. So let's share the screen, and I'll go ahead and hit the the mm -hmm. dial here. Oh my god! It's so fun. And people can can choose. Wheel of Blaze. Gwyneth! <laughs> awesome. Love it. You're Gwyneth, so I'll, I will get in touch with her. Gwyneth is well named. She's Gwyneth the Gwyneth. So I think you kind of had to choose her, like she was doing yeah. that. <laughs> kind of thing. Oh my gosh. Margaret, you're so fun. I just love you. We all love you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight as an author yourself. Thank you, Jenna. This, this is lovely. Nice. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye, booktubers. Bye, everybody. Thank you.